Okay, I'm, I'm going to start. So hello, hello everybody and welcome to our show. Oh, sorry, to our talk. My name is Roman and I'm a technical solutions engineer at Google. Today I'm going to be talking about Kubernetes support at Google Cloud. Uh, I just said that I'm technical solutions engineer, but that's just a fancy name for a support engineer. So why we're we all here? We all know that Kubernetes is a powerful container orchestrator. We are all here, that's why we're here, and Kubernetes is turning 10 years this year. We all know that. The first KubeCon was almost nine years ago. After all this time, we are all long past the demos, all long past the POCs. Many of you already adopted Kubernetes and using it in production. And, uh, <clears throat> but with all, the, all of the, ben that's all due to benefits Kubernetes brings. But with all of the benefits, there also come the challenges. Let's face it, Kubernetes is not a magic wand. It also needs some love and attention. But fear not, that's where people like me and my colleagues come in to save the day. Let's take a look at some trends. Out of all the cases, Kubernetes-related cases received in 2023, here is a list of future cases by future in descending on order. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, but these are just the top seven features. If we take a look at this list, at the first place is networking. And it makes sense. One of the main use cases of Kubernetes are microservices. And all those microservices need to chat. As a result, first place is networking. Node-related issues are usually related to node stability, resource allocation, or node failures. Even if Kubernetes has like, auto-healing mechanisms and it reschedules the workload, it replaces the failed node, what I noticed is that people really care about what happens to that node and they really want to know why they failed. For control plane issues, we are dealing with QBPI server, controller manager, etcd. These issues usually do not affect the workload directly, but they do affect the scheduling part, the orchestration part. So they do get your attention really quickly. Even if your control plane is managed by a service provider, you can still break it, depending on what you're running in your cluster. All those control plane components, they don't have infinite resources. So for example, if you have a controller that runs and creates only resources and doesn't delete them, you can easily fill out the etcd database, causing issues. Another way to look at this list is uh, which feature is the most popular and the most complicated at the same time. Like if uh, as the feature set grows, so does the complexity. And where complexity comes in, this is where support comes in. So let me share with you a real life case that had me scratching my head. So when customers create cases, there are multiple automated jobs that are running, analyzing the configuration, the logs, and try to help customers even before they are opening a case. But still, if they're open a case, opening a case, all the output from all those jobs come to us as support engineers and help us troubleshoot the issue further. Even with all those automated jobs, they just can't catch them all. So let's just take a look at the case. So this is a real life case. All the names were changed, but the issue is still the same. So this is how customers create cases. This is the case number. This is who created the case, John Doe. What a popular name. So. John created the case and he says, not able to create GKE clusters. It is failing with the below error. And the error is like a CVS receipt. Apparently, he wanted to put the whole line in the subject and it didn't feel fit in. So John can also set the priority P1 is the highest priority, which means we need to move fast to help John. Category, so here he can select technical Kubernetes engine and then after Kubernetes engine, he can also select the feature, one of the features that I, we've seen in the previous slide, but he didn't do that, so we'll have to figure that out. Project ID, then cluster name, namespace, node name, workload name. 
The thing is, like, all of these details, they do help us. But customers, when they are in a hurry, they really don't feel, don't put, either they don't put the details or they put the, them incorrectly. So we just need to read the case description to actually understand what's happening. So this is what we're doing here. We create GKE clusters for our application and we do kubectl patching. It was working fine two days ago. Suddenly we see this error for kubectl patch, blah, blah, blah. And we have this certificate signed by unknown authority. Okay, so I have an error. I have where it's coming from, but I don't know where the kubectl is running. I don't know on which cluster does this apply. So I need to ask these details to try to help John. So this is what I'm doing here. Can you please tell me, does it occur on all of the cluster? Is it happening on newly created clusters or existing clusters as well? And John is apparently in a hurry and he just says, any update on this? Okay, but, oh, now just a little while later, he apparently seen my question and says, this is occurring on new GKE clusters. The patching command is working fine from my MacBook, but when it's running from a Google VM, the command is not working. So this is a very important piece of information because kubectl is working fine on his MacBook, but it's failing on the Google VM. So we kinda can, Limit this to a Google VM. And next, this is a blocker for our production rollout. Please update on this. Okay, we need to really hurry this here. So I have a little bit of more information, but he has that error. And that error can come from, so he's running kubectl. All the information kubectl has is from kubeconfig. So any manual tampering of that kubeconfig can generate this error. So what I'm trying to Say here is like to, to tell John to regenerate kubeconfig. Hopefully, he will get a fresh new kubeconfig. Everything will be fine. Problem will be solved. This is what I'm asking John to do. Please regenerate kubeconfig. John comes back. We are still facing the same issue and an AP address. <laughs> like, I have this AP address. I can find the VM by the IP address because we as support engineers, we have read-only access. We can see the configuration. We can see the VMs. We can see the logs. But I cannot log in into VM because there could be private information for the customer. So this doesn't really help me. Then I'm asking John, did you try to recreate kubeconfig? Because I didn't really understand from the previous reply. And I'm also asking him, can you please run this kubectl with insecure skip TLS verify just to make sure Cube API server is reachable from that VM, so we can kind of limit further down the problem. And John comes back with, we just have the same error, and again an IP address. At this point in time, I'm just, let's just jump on a call and troubleshoot this issue live as real engineers do. So when we jump on a call, I can actually ask John to run some commands, see the output, and try to figure this out. Okay, so this is what we're doing here. John is connected to this Bastion host. And just to see the issue, let's just try kubectl, sorry, kubectl get pod. kubectl, kubectl get pod. Okay, and sure enough, we see the same error, certificate signed by an unknown authority. Okay, just to make sure that John did what I ask him to do to regenerate kubeconfig. Let's just do that once again. But first, we need to back it up. So in case John needs it later, remove the one that is there, generate a new one. Okay, we're generating for cluster 35. That's the problem where, uh, actually it's for cluster 60, that's where the he reported the problem, and let's just, we have a shiny new kubeconfig. Hopefully, it should work. But no, we still have the same issue. Now, at this point, I don't understand what's happening. Like, we have just generated the new kubeconfig. Everything should be working. I have the proper certificate. I have, like, it should be fine. Like, what's happening? At this point, I need to read some documentation. 
I know I told you we are experts, but we're just basically on a never-ending date with documentation. So reading here, I can see client certificate authentication is enabled by bypassing this flag to the API server. So what this means is that we have a certificate authority that is used by Cube API server, and all the client certificates and this certificate used by the API server should be signed by the same certificate authority. If this is true, everything should be working fine. We can actually check that. So let's do that. The certificate used by kubectl can be found in kubeconfig. So let's just take that config view with the raw output so we, it contains also the certificate. We provide the path to the certificate authority data we decode it, we put it into a file. Good. We have the kubectl certificate. Now we can also get the certificate from the Cube API server. Let's just find the cluster API address first. We also can get that from kubeconfig. We get the cluster API. And with the mighty OpenSSL command, we can actually get the certificate. Again, get the certificate, put it into a file. Again, with OpenSSL, we can actually check the issuers of both of the certificates, the one used by kubeconfig and the one used uh, by Cube API server. Let's do that. This is for Cube API server, the issuer, and for kubeconfig, for kubectl. And we can see the issuers are different. So this is the problem. I still don't understand how this can happen because we have just generated the cube config. But I'm focused on solving the problem so John can use this bastion host to make this de him, his deployments. We can actually do that. So the problem here is that issuers are different and that's why he gets this error. So if we use the certificate from Cube API server and we put it in cube config, everything should be working fine. Let's do that. We're setting the context for the current context with the certificate, the certificate authority for the current context. And we are taking the certificate from Cube API, which we just got, encoded in base 64. And let's do that. Let's do kubectl get pod. It's working. The error is gone. This is kind of good because we mitigated the issue, but I still don't know what happened. Like why this issue was there in the first place. Because like the, as I told you multiple times already, <laughs> we have just generated kubeconfig. Like, why is this is happening? Just to make sure everything is fine, I'm asking John to run some, run some more commands, like kubectl get node. And he says, like, oh, look at this. This is from cluster 35. This is a different cluster. And here I'm, com I'm like, I know what's happening. I know what's the problem. John thinks he's connecting to cluster 60 but he's actually connecting to cluster 35. Maybe the IP address of the Cube API server is the same. We can also check that. Let's check in Cube config the server IP address and see here we have two IP addresses of the Cube API server, two same IP addresses. So just to reiterate, John has this bastion host that he uses to connect to different clusters. There is some kind of routing here that should route requests to a correct subnet where the correct Cube API server is. In this case, John generated the Cube config for cluster 60, but he's actually connecting to cluster 35, getting this whole error. When Cube config is generated, it has the certificate for cluster 60. So if we generate Cube config now for cluster 60, kubectl get pod, everything is working fine. Oh, sorry, yeah. Ah, no, so cluster 60 is the problem. If we generate for cluster 35, everything should be working fine again. <laughs> See, no error. Problem solved. Now I can go and get a cup of coffee or something. But there is another case coming in. 
support is a 24 seven operation. So I can just hand this case, this next case off to my colleague, Sian. All set up. <laughs> Sorry, it's just not being detected. Okay, um, I'm sorry for that. Um, yeah, I guess talks can go however they go. Okay, um, so I'm taking over from Roman. I am another GK firefighter and my name is Sian. And we're going to be looking through another case and this one started off as a P2 case. Okay, so let's take a look at the case. So the final priority was P1, but started off as a P2. We have priorities all the way between P1 to P4, and P2 is just under uh, P1, and basically it's that something is broken, but the customer is not down in production. And let's go through just what has been reported to us. So we have the title, we have um, a message here saying that auto scaling is not working. We have project ID. Um, we have a cluster name, that's good. We have the namespace name. Uh, we have the workload name. And then we have a brief description here, which says that they have scaled up their workload, but most of the pods are in the pending state. Again, not much information for me to go on. They haven't, for example, told me um, when they first noticed the issue, when they attempted scale up, what's the business impact for them, if there are any errors or relevant log messages. So from there, I just request for the information because as I say many times, we're not really magicians, we don't know everything and we have to ask many times. Because it's P2, um, I decide to wait for the customer to come back to me and provide the details before I do any more work. Okay, after a while, they come back and they say we're seeing messages like this. So zero or three nodes are available, which is basically telling me um, that the, pod, the pods couldn't be scheduled on a node. They couldn't find a suitable node. And then they also share um, some messages here about um, cube cattle, um, not, not uh, returning, couldn't get resource list for metrics. And it's not really clear to me how the two are related. Again, they haven't told me anything about the business impact. They haven't told me what time the issue started. But at this point, I'm like, it looks like it's still ongoing, so I might as well check. As Roman mentioned, we have uh, read-only access to uh, uh, customer clusters. So we can run um, cube cattle commands. We can view their logs, and we can also check uh, just their configurations in the UI. So. Um, that's what we're going to do now. 
Okay, sorry, I need to log in again. Okay. Okay. So we're just going to check and see how many pods are still in the pending state. Okay. So they have a number of pods that are in the pending state, which means the issue is still ongoing. And I'm just going to pick uh, one of the pods at this point and describe it and see if there's anything interesting at all in the events. Okay, so if we look at the events here from the top, we can see a failed scale up. Um, so we can see that there was an attempt to scale up, uh, looking at the trigger for scale up. And uh, at the bottom, we can see failed scheduling messages, just like the one um, that was shared on the case. So part of the fan of support is uh, when you get a case, you really have no idea where it's going to go. You have no idea um, what's relevant to look at, what uh, you need to ignore. And you're just trying to follow and think, what's logical? What should I check next? So at this point, I can see scale up is being triggered, but I'm not, I'm not really sure whether I really want to dig into auto scaling logs. So I think, okay, let me check if there's even any attempts that are being made to uh, create new nodes. So um, all creation requests for objects, they go to API server logs and on GKE you can enable uh, some control plane logging so you can view API server logs. But as Roman said, we don't know everything so I want to know what does a create request for a node uh, look like. So here I can see the verb and I can see it's a post and it's for slash API slash V1 slash nodes. So I say, okay, um, let me create a query and look at just, I uh, can use these two strings to search the logs and see what I find there. And I really don't know at this point what it is that I'm looking for. I'm just trying to build a picture and see what happens next. So, because the issue is still ongoing and the customer didn't provide me any idea of uh, the time, I'll just search over the first one hour. If needed, I can always look back a little further. So let's run the query. Okay, so there's lots of logs. I'll just expand one of them and have a look. And I can see here already that there's a stack trace. Um, yeah, so I'll just go through the stack trace all the way to the end and see if there's anything useful. Okay, so I can see it ends in an error and it says something about a uh, failed calling a webhook. And the webhook is check ignore label gatekeeper.sh. Okay, now maybe I'm finding something. So I'm sure a lot of you know about uh, gatekeeper, either you're using it or you've heard about it before. And then I read a bit more um, in the error message and I see it says it failed to call the webhook. Um, I see a post request to the webhook. I see a timeout of three seconds. Okay, that will be important later. And then I see a context deadline exceeded message. So context deadline exceeded, context canceled message. I'm sure you've seen them many times in Kubernetes. They don't really tell you much. Um, so just from experience and some Googling, um, I figured out that the error is it's just a generic error in Go. And basically what it means is that a request was made and it timed out. It didn't complete in the timeout that was set. Okay, let's see what else we can find in the API server logs. There's also this trace log, um, which I'm not so familiar with. So as I said, we really don't know what we'll find. So I'll just expand it and have a look. Okay, so it seems to be sort of a, a breakdown for the latency of the request to create a node. Um, and over here, I can see all the requests, some requests to webhooks. And again, at the bottom, I see the internal error. And I see again the webhook message, um, the webhook mentioned, check, ignore label, gatekeeper.sh. Okay, so it looks like uh, the webhook could be involved somehow. So um, it makes sense for me to check for just what's happening with the webhook in the API server logs. 
and that's what I do. As I said, I'm just following the breadcrumbs that I'm finding and trying to find um, what makes the most sense to look at next. So again, here we'll just search for the string webhook and then search for the past one hour. Okay, so we can see lots of yellow and red and yellow is basically a warning message and red is, a, is an error message. So um, we're looking for just to see if there's anything else we can see that's useful. We can see there's still more trace uh, logs returned here. And if we look at the check ignore label that gatekeeper sh specifically, we see again the helpful context the line exceeded message. So nothing so exciting there. Okay, so at this point, back to the case, at this point the customer uh, increases the priority of the case. They need this running in production right now. So it's now a P1 for them. And I just offer to hop on a call with them. So on the call, I explained what it is I found so far. So at this point, I don't have um, a complete picture of why it is that the uh, webhook is affecting the creation of the, of the nodes, but I have a pretty good idea that that's where the problem is. So in support, we often are prioritizing a mitigation over understanding the root cause. And I just advise the customer, why don't you back up this webhook? Um, you can always restore it from the backup and then uh, just go ahead and delete it for now. So let's pretend I'm the customer for now and we will delete the webhook. And then we'll check to see if more pods will come into the running state now that the webhook is deleted. Okay, it seems it's going to take a while, but yeah. So um, webhooks are they, they are a classic example of that party tools that you can install in your cluster that can have very uh, many different effects. They can really affect the stability of your cluster and they can manifest in many different ways. Okay, now we can see that once we deleted the webhook, the pods are now running. So. With uh, webhooks, the thing we really encourage is just to have a good idea of what the failure looks like, what um, namespaces you're covering, what objects are affected by the webhook. And in general, for third-party tools, there's very many operators that you can install now in Kubernetes, very many daemon sets that you can run, um, like system security daemon sets. And we encourage you just to understand what is the uh, daemon set doing, um, what does it look like when it fails, and will it have significant impact on, my on your cluster and on the stability. Um, so... I still haven't found the root cause of the issue, so uh, we'll just look into that and we'll take a look at the webhook that I also made a backup of before the customer deleted it. And there's two sections, uh, but we're interested in this section with the name check ignore label .sh. And we can also confirm here it has a timeout of three seconds, which we saw in the logs. And we see here a failure policy of fail. And again, back to documentation. We're curious to understand what does a failure policy of fail mean? So looking up the documentation again, a failure policy of fail means that there was an error calling the webhook. And when this happens, it causes the request to be rejected. So if you have ignore, the request is allowed to continue. But if you have a failure policy uh, set to rejected, then the request will fail. So in the case that you don't need to strictly enforce um, a policy or, or use a webhook, it's better to set it to ignore. And then together with this, the customer also came back and they explained that the backend pods for the gatekeeper webhook were overloaded at the time of the issue. And that's why the requests were, like the response was not being returned within the timeout. So, it's sort of an example of a collaboration between us 
and the customer. So now we'll switch gears a bit and we'll go back to the presentation and we just have a few um, just tips on troubleshooting that we've collected just working on many different kind of, kinds of cases. So although the cases we showed were not the best example of this, we really encourage you to have a well-defined problem, get all the details. This is the whatever workload name is involved, um, what time the issue started, any relevant log messages. Uh, if you have architecture diagrams that show different uh, pieces and how they are connected, that's even better. Get an idea of if anything has been changed, were there any new deployments, when did they happen? Just have a record of this as it really helps. And then the next thing is using the whatever error messages or log messages you've got or just the behavior you're seeing, trying to understand, is this a real problem or a misunderstood feature? So for example, with things like um, a cluster autoscaler, we often see people complaining or oh, the cluster is not scaling down. But if you actually read the documentation, some more, many times it is working as intended. So just make the documentation your friend. Um, the next thing is to narrow down the scope of troubleshooting. You can't be looking at everything. Um, so you need to try and think, especially in Kubernetes, it helps either in terms of what uh, my colleague mentioned, features or components. So in this case, I could either have looked at the scheduling or auto scaling, um, but you're basically trying to eliminate what it is that you're focusing on. And then once you have a, a list of components that you want to focus on, create a list of hypotheses and, you need to, and you, then you can test them. And you're trying to go from the most simple hypothesis to the more complex ones. You don't want to start with anything that's too hard. And then lastly, if you are not able, if you can see that there's some relationship between the issue that you're seeing and uh, just something that you've observed in, for example, the logs, try as much as possible to mitigate the problem. And this goes back to the first step. For example, if you knew this happened just after a new rollout, then you could try and roll back whatever change was made and then just collect all before you make the the rollback change for example you can collect all the data you need so that later on you can uh, perform your analysis and of course if all else fails and you're a gk customer please feel free to open a case and if you have all these details it's also really helpful to us and it saves us a lot of time because as i said we're not magicians Okay, um, thank you everyone for your time. Please scan the QR code to give feedback. And if you have any questions, we'll be happy to take them. Thank you.